Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is out, guys. I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard good things. Until the 2014 film, most non-comic readers and many casual comic readers had never heard of this team, which was, in turn, named after another, even less well-known team. The original Guardians of the Galaxy were from the far future, consisting of such strange heroes as Charlie-27 from Jupiter, Martin X from Pluto, Nikki, whose head is on fire, and thousand-year-old astronaut Vance Astro. But those aren't the guys you care about. I mean, the Guardians that moviegoers love consist of a talking raccoon, a tree with a limited vocabulary, a hyper-violent green-skinned woman, and Star-Lord, Earthman rocketed into space where he finds the weight of the galaxy on his shoulders, and oh my god, he's Buck Rogers. Buck Rogers made his first appearance in a short story written by Philip Francis Nolan in the pulp magazine Amazing Stories, and by 1929 was popular enough to star in a newspaper comic strip. Buck was a veteran of the First World War, put into suspended animation and waking up in the 25th century, and he was the prototype for a new archetype of adventure character. The space-born Earthman, who, despite being new to interstellar life, becomes the only hero who can overcome the galaxy's ills. Buck was clever and athletic, and able to think in ways the men of the future had all but forgotten about. And Buck would be the model for space opera heroes for decades to come, and maybe I should explain that term, at least in the way I'm using it. Space opera refers to a specific subgenre of science fiction set in outer space, with very light emphasis on the psi and a stronger emphasis on the phi. Heavy into adventure and melodrama, think Star Wars or Firefly. But Golden Age space opera was even more so. Big heroes, bigger villains, and a stock group of sidekicks nearly every space opera hero had. The girlfriend, the older scientist who may or may not be the girlfriend's father, the kid, sometimes a tough friend. We'd see it over and over. The old ship is traveling nicely, Barnes. This ought to be a swell trip for us. Don't shoot! I'm a real Earthling! Those monsters are our enemies! We'll soon be on Jupiter! To find out what changes men into beasts! A big job, Greg! Those antimatter insects explode anything they come in contact with! And here come a swarm at us! Well, that cleans the universe of that scoundrel. People were constantly being flung into the far future. And let me tell you, nobody can lead an intergalactic defense force like a modern-day Earthman. Well, just ask Flash Gordon. Following the same basic formula as Buck Rogers, Buck's most famous knockoff wasn't rocketed into the future, but was simply shot off into space. Created by Alex Raymond in 1934, Flash was a studly athlete, a polo player in the earliest incarnations, although his most famous version was a football jock, who joins his scientist pal Dr. Zarkov and girlfriend Del Arden in blasting off in a homemade rocket ship to stop the villainous alien Ming the Merciless from recklessly crashing the planet Mongo into Earth. Over the years, he meets a number of offbeat acquaintances, such as the winged warrior Prince Volton, but Flash himself remains an all-American Earthman. The Earthman in space archetype was very common in the 40s and 50s, and not just in the comics. Well, in the movies, you had Commando Cody saving the Earth from the radar men from the moon, while Captain Video hawked decoder rings on one of the most popular early television shows for children. Yo, electronic wizard, master of time and space, Guardian of the safety of the world. And all it took was a ray gun, a jetpack, and a square jaw to save the universe. But this early spaceman archetype started to fade out by the time we started launching actual space flights in real life. You still had science fiction by all means, but as space travel was coming closer to reality, the nature of the beast was changing. Now, DC held on to the stereotype for a while, giving us characters like Captain Comet and the Space Rangers, and most importantly, Adam Strange. Those alien invaders shooting space torpedoes at me to stop me from ray blasting their deadly pendulum. Adam Strange was an archaeologist who was accidentally struck by a so-called Zeta Beam from the planet Ron, which instantly transported him to that world. There he met and fell in love with Alana, daughter of Sardath, the scientist who created the Zeta Beam. He became Ron's greatest hero with a jetpack and a ray gun, but returned to Earth each time the Zeta Beam wore off, having to calculate the location of the next beam to return to Ron and his beloved Alana. And Adam Strange remains a mainstay of the DC Universe even today. But over on the Marvel end of town, the Silver Age space heroes started creating entirely new archetypes. Captain Marvel of the Kree turned the archetype around by having an alien with a ray gun and jetpack come to Earth, 
before gaining cosmic awareness and becoming the protector of the universe, leaving the classic spaceman archetype completely behind, while the Silver Surfer was, right from the beginning, something else altogether. But in Marvel Super Heroes number 18, in 1969, we meet Vance Astro, a modern-day Earthman who, like Buck Rogers decades before, finds himself in suspended animation and waking up in the far future. For Astro, he awoke to a world where humans had long since colonized the solar system and evolved into entirely new races. And he, along with Charlie 27, Martin X, Nikki, Yandu, and the strange alien Starhawk formed the Guardians of the Galaxy. This Guardians team traveled back in time. Yes, I know it's an alternate timeline, you pedantic know it all. Several times, teaming with the Avengers and even getting their own fairly long running comic in the 90s. However, even as the Guardians were establishing their modest reputation, a character named Peter Quill made his first appearance in Marvel Preview No. 4 in 1976. Star-Lord, as he's better known, was the son of a human-like alien and an Earth woman, and ended up eventually going out into space. The specifics are pretty different between the comic Star-Lord and his movie counterpart, but needless to say, Star-Lord was a daring space adventurer in the classic ray-gun-wielding mold. His appearances were sparse and almost never intersected with the greater Marvel Universe until he appeared in a 2004 Thanos miniseries. And yes, I know that his earliest appearances are now considered to be an alternate reality, but this is, this is just an overview. It's not an official handbook of the Marvel Universe profile. But Star-Lord's career in the mainstream Marvel Universe really got kick-started when he appeared in the event storyline Annihilation, in which he helped stop galactic devastation from a swarm of extra-dimensional insects. Okay, it was a much, much better story than that sounds. Star-Lord's involvement in the story and its follow-up Annihilation Conquest led to him recruiting several of his fellow warriors from the Annihilation War, such as Adam Warlock, Philavel, and... Drax the Destroyer, Gamora, Rocket Raccoon, and Groot. A brand new Guardians of the Galaxy, but actually they're kind of the first Guardians of the Galaxy because the other one's from the future, but they're from an alternate timeline. But they, anyway, they did come back in time, so they were in this timeline before... To, anyway! I am Groot! You said it, brother. And so, Buck Rogers gives the comics a space opera, Space Opera gives us Star-Lord, Star-Lord hangs out with a raccoon in a tree, and that is the Guardians of the Galaxy's Golden Age influence. Right this very minute, in a galaxy too close for comfort, Star- Well, that was unexpected. Smoking rockets, man, you don't think this is another android of Eula? And at the real Eula got away with Ramo. Not with Ramo, gentlemen. Without him. 